welcome to the Alex Salmon Show as we approach the halfway point in this Christmas election. Today we return to our celebrated pundits panel to assess who's made the early running in the campaign, but also whether there are still some surprise presents to come. In the blue corner, we have Peter Oborn, the man who knows more about the Tory party than most Tories. In this festive panto, he plays the ghost of Christmas present. In the yellow corner, we feature Lembert Opic, one-time Liberal Democrat presidential candidate, but now a born-again Brexiteer. Lembert is the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And in the red corner, we feature a newcomer to our panel, former Labour advisor, Professor Richard Murphy, who will assess whether the opposition has still some Christmas crackers to pull. Richard assumes the mantle of the ghost of Christmas past. And to hold up the tartan end of this panto, we have Ruth Wishart, a woman who is rumoured to have ghostwritten the best speeches of successive First Ministers of Scotland. We'll turn to our panel shortly, but first your reaction to last week's show, featuring the spices of the Catalan politicians locked up for extraordinarily harsh prison sentences for their role in organising and defending the independence referendum of 2017. Now, we asked the new Spanish government for their comments last week, but have yet to receive a reply. When it comes to hand, we will feature that response in future shows as we continue our series on Weather Catalonia. However, in a statement covered in the Washington Post of October 14th, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez was quoted as saying, in a social and democratic state of law, compliance means full compliance. This has been a judicial process with full guarantees and transparency. The government of Spain will work in the coming days towards guaranteeing public order and protecting our democratic laws, as it has always done. So to your tweets, and first we hear from Lynn. Lynn says, wow, those Catalonian women were so inspiring. Shame on the EU for not helping Catalonia. I'm so happy that Scotland stands by Catalonia. Vista Catalonia, she says. Fiona says, fascinating insight into the impact of their husbands being political prisoners. Remember to keep writing to them. Jordina says, thank you for this series. Could I suggest that interview questions can be answered in Catalan and subtitle, please? Well, Jordina, sometimes we do use interpreters, but we thought our guest English was really first class and it was great to hear it firsthand directly from them. Alan says, this current interview is wonderful but heartbreaking. I hope they stay strong. Lovely message, Alan. And Gia says, what a lovely woman. I hope your man gets to come home soon. He deserves our thanks. Andy says, the children will one day carry the torch of freedom. And finally, Gordon says, Chell is an inspiration. What a strong woman. It's horrific that it has come to this though. We return to Catalonia next week, but today we're back in Blighty, covering the progress of the Christmas election. The UK general election takes place on the 12th of December. There are a number of parties standing, including the Conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrats, Change UK, the Greens, the Brexit Party and UKIP, and additionally in Scotland, the SNP, in Wales, Plaid Cymru, and in Northern Ireland, the DUP, Sinn Féin, SDLP, Ulster Unionist Party, and the Alliance Party, as well as a number of candidates standing as independents. But first, to Scotland and to Alex. And I'm joined from Glasgow by the doyen of Scottish political journalism, a woman who's been covering Scottish elections since the last winter election of 1974. I'm delighted to be joined by Ruth Wishart. I'm not sure I'm delighted to be carbon dated quite like that, Alex. Now, now Ruth, the, the, party, the main party leaders, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Boris Johnson, have both been in Scotland in last week, but neither visit was uh, an unalloyed success. Not at all. In fact, Boris Johnson has taken a leaf out of the Theresa May playbook and he's been going round in kind of hermetically sealed posses. I mean, he went to, into a distillery, but only, uh, only journalists and authorised people were allowed in. There was no punters allowed in to ask him questions. And when somebody remonstrated with him from the press corps, he said, well, you're a voter, aren't you? So he's, he's, he's been kept well away from anything resembling the electorate. And Jeremy Corbyn, well, Jeremy Corbyn came up and uh, had a lot of difficulty. First of all, he changed his pitch on a second independence referendum three times in the space of two days, which is never much of a good look. And then he got heckled about his views on terrorism. So, no, I don't think they'll look back with fondness on their Scottish sojourn. But then, of course, Scottish political journalists have something of a reputation. I mean, I seem to remember that even the formidable Alistair Campbell was a bit wary of Scottish journalists. 
Yes, not without due cause. <laughs> I don't think Alistair had a terrifically good press up here either, but and Tony Blair certainly didn't. So this uh, this uh, suspicion of um, English leaders coming over the border for a quick sojourn is uh, has got a very checkered history. But how about Joe Swinson? I mean, previously when there's been Scottish leaders of the Liberal Democrats, one thinks of the, the late Charles Kennedy, there's been quite a Liberal bounce as a result of that. Is there any sign of a, a Swinson bounce? I don't really think so, you know. I'm trying to be fair here, but Charlie Kennedy, as uh, we both know, was an enormously popular figure um, on both sides of the border. I mean, he, was, he had a great uh, personal charisma and charm. Jo Swinson, I don't think, um, can emulate that. And also, she's, I mean, she's still very much a Tyro uh, party leader. And, and I think people um, are recalling from the suggestion that she's putting herself forward as an alternative uh, prime minister after two minutes in the job. And how about the, the Greens and the Brexit party? Is there any sign that they're going to cut the mustard in any seat in Scotland? I can't see, or certainly in the case of the of the Brexit party, there is absolutely no way whatsoever that they're going to... They'll be lucky to get into triple figures in some of the places they're standing, I would guess. Just like UKIP, they hardly, you know, they hardly raise a titter here in Scotland. Uh, the Greens are in a slightly different position. They do a little bit better in Holyrood elections because um, we have proportional representation of a kind here, which allows some of the smaller parties to get in with a shout. On a first-past-the-post, I don't think they've got any chance at all. They have, interestingly, been persuaded to stand down from two of the seats where the SNP incumbent has a very tiny majority on the grounds that there's no point in damaging the pro-independence vote. So, with problems for the other parties, uh, the SNP riding high, are they unassailable for the rest of this campaign? I don't think so, though I do think one of their great problems now is going to be managing expectations. People keep talking about them winning more than 50 seats, which of course they did in 2015. And when they lost 21 of these seats in 2017, people thought it was a great setback. And in some ways, I suppose it was. But considering that previously they'd only have ever had six Westminster seats, I think that they were doing well. Their problem, I think, as I say, is to manage expectations. The current polling suggests they might get about 46 seats, which is, uh, which is not too shabby. And how did the, the two referendums effectively interplay in Scotland? That is a potential European referendum, a Brexit referendum, and a, a potential Scottish independence referendum. How do these two issues uh, match together in terms of the election debate? Well, it's quite interesting, actually, because um, both the, the Lib Dems and the Scottish National Party are both in favour of referendums on Europe, uh, Brexit referendums, and the, it's the chronology of that that will prove interesting for the Scottish National Party. However, the Liberal Democrat Party are in a bit of a bind because they're very much in favour of a second Brexit referendum, but very much opposed to a second UK referendum. And, of course, that lays them open to the charge of hypocrisy. I think um, the SNP have got problems in as much as a third of the SNP voters apparently voted leave, whereas Nicola Sturgeon and the Scottish National Party have put forward a very positive pro-Remain stance, and they've also put forward a very positive desire for a second Brexit referendum. I don't know whether that will harm them or not. How about a forecast? What do you expect to happen in the, the second half of this match? Well, unless things change dramatically from how they are at the moment, I would expect the Conservatives, who have 13 seats now, to lose... Uh, uh, a, a proportion of these, perhaps a third of them, because, of course, Ruth Davidson is no longer the leader of the Tory party in Scotland. I would expect the Labour Party to lose some seats as well. And there'll be a lot of interest in the two SNP seats, which have tiny, tiny majorities. Everybody's going to pay quite close attention, I would imagine, to these two constituencies. Ruth Wishart from Glasgow, thank you very much. My pleasure. There's been no shortage of controversy north or south of the border. But has any of it shifted the dial on the strong Tory lead? And will Boris Johnson be principal boy through this whole pantomime season? Our political panel were unerringly accurate through the Brexit parliamentary drama. Can they sustain their predictive powers for the final stages of the Christmas campaign? Remember, last time up they were in sharp disagreement about likely outcomes. But what do they think now? Over to the panel in conversation with Alex. Now you join me with a prestigious panel of political pundits. If anyone knows what's going to happen in this Christmas election, then they will. We've got Peter Oborn, Professor Richard Murphy, and of course, Lebanon OPEC. Now, Peter Oborn, you said last time you were on at the start of the election campaign, you thought Boris Johnson might be heading for a bit of trouble. Doesn't look like it so far. No, I, as ever, I miscalculated. <laughs> uh, I, uh, 
I felt that the the Liberals and Labour would get their act together much more. They're, they're fighting each other. They obviously hate each other more than the they hate the Tories, which is quite unusual. Um, and, and to the left, ha there hasn't been anything like a Romainer alliance, which I thought might develop. And then on the other side, we've seen what I'm quite convinced, although it's conflicting signals, that there's been some form of deal between the Bre Farage and, and, and the Tories, which means that the Brexit threat to the Tory vote has, has really capsized. Well, let me open. That was your point. You said if there was such a deal, uh, then it would be plain sailing for, for Boris Johnson. But, but Nigel Farage says it was a unilateral deal. It doesn't seem to be much of a deal when he withdraws his candidates and, and doesn't get anything for it. Well, I was right about the deal. And whether it's unilateral or behind closed doors, it doesn't matter. What uh, Farage has done has given, has given uh, the Tories a clear run in 317 seats. Now, there's still a slight problem here because in some of the other marginal seats, the Farage threat could still be something of a problem. But by and large, they've got that clear run. There is another deal as well, which we've forgotten about, the Lib Dems, the Greens, and Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalists. But that's virtually irrelevant. I don't think Plaid Cymru were expecting to win many seats in Kent, for example. Uh, and so, as a result of that, we've got the exact deal I thought was necessary to get the Conservatives that overall majority, which I predicted the last time. Uh, Richard Murphy, I mean, the one policy which has perhaps cut through the, the Brexit fog it has been the British broadband policy announced by Labour. Now, that commanded the agenda, at least for a day or so. Why hasn't it had more people rallying to its standard? It's weird, isn't it? It's one of the cheapest things that Labour could have announced compared to their big plans on infrastructure spending and so on. And yet it caught attention because it was universal. And that does appeal to a load of people, and I suspect it is working in some constituencies. Why didn't it go better? Because it wasn't sold as a job creation tool. This isn't an even an anti-business policy, which some people have put it as. It's a pro-business policy. So you, what you're saying is uh, that Jeremy Corbyn should have gone to Barnsley and said it's British broadband for Barnsley and several thousand jobs. I still don't s understand why he doesn't say this is a jobs in every constituency policy. The problem with this, though, is it's going to happen anyway. Uh, commercial demands will eventually make this occur. And as you said yourself, it was big for a day. But however hard Corbyn has tried to divert the election away from Brexit, he hasn't succeeded. So we get back to the problem that they haven't really got a Brexit policy. And that writes them out of the script. I think there's another issue here which is very important, is that the, there is a massive media bias against uh, Corbyn and in favour oh. of Johnson. Mm -hmm. And so Corbyn comes up with a brilliant idea. By the way, you're, you're wrong. It wasn't going to happen anyway. There wasn't no. going to be universal free broadband. No. I don't know what you're talking about there. Well, you're but, um, the, um, <laughs> he's, he's the liberal Democrat. Uh, yeah, I don't know what he is. But anyway, he's... Um, attack him. Uh, he, 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 that, it was a brilliant policy. And, of course, he, he, because the, the, they're not playing on a level playing field, the, the ref is on the other side, uh, it's very, very hard for Corbyn to get his messages across. But then surely in the last election, that, that was the same, and yet the momentum started for, for Corbyn. Couldn't we, in the second half, see a, a Corbyn revival? I think it's, it's perfectly possible, because we are now getting to the stage where the, there are regulatory reasons why the, all the, media, well, the, the broadcast media have to be fair at any rate. So join us after the break, where our prestigious panel will answer the key question of who's going to bag the turkey dinner and who will have to make do with the leftovers? Join us then. Welcome back. And now our panel are going to answer the key question of who's going to win this Christmas election. Now, Lembert Opec, just imagine for a second you've been reconciled to the Liberal Democrats and you're sitting in the war room at this halfway stage in the election campaign. What would your advice be? Two bits of advice. First of all, stay absolutely resolute on Remain. This time, they've got traction. They're clearly the, the Remain party uh, for England. Uh, and the second thing is, get the leader some media training. She's coming across as a lightweight. It might be fixable, but she just looks like she's whinging. And that isn't effective. Uh, so she needs to build that gravitas, but keep the message. But what's the contrast? We've had some constituency polls which are look like good news for the Liberal Democrats, while simultaneously the, the national polls look flatlined or even going downwards. There's no mystery there. The 
Liberal Democrats simply aren't going to poll well across the country. They're going to get a relatively small percentage, but it's concentrated. That's how they're going to make some gains, and I think they will make some gains. Uh, but they'll let lots of those no-hope seats crash and burn, and that suppresses the national poll. It doesn't really matter what they got nationally. What really matters is what they get in the maybe 20 or 30 seats they hope to win. Now, Professor Richard Murphy, you're now reconciled to the Labour Party. They want you back in as a, an advisor. You're sitting in their war room at the halfway stage of this election campaign. What would your advice be? Get off the fence. Say, yes, we're going to have a second referendum. We are going to ask you again because the facts have changed and we respect that that gives you the chance for another vote. But we're going to recommend Remain because leave is going to cost you money. So Labour has to actually say, we believe in Remain, but we will listen to you again. And if you disagree, we'll do what you want. But we're not going to sit on the fence, which Jeremy Corbyn is doing, which is saying, I'll stand by and watch whatever it is. He's actually going to come into a position. Now, John McDonnell and many others in the shadow cabinet would agree with that, of course. It's Jeremy Corbyn who doesn't. So he's got to listen to his key colleagues and go with them. And do you think uh, this is salvageable, the, the, the campaign? Is the, is the lead of the Tories currently unbridgeable or could there be momentum for Labour in the next few weeks? I don't think Labour is going to get a majority of seats in this election. I think that's beyond their reach. Do I think that Labour could form a minority administration with support of other parties without necessarily going into coalition with them? Yes, I do. I think that is plausible because I think that there is actually a long way to go Johnson is a proven gaffe maker, and at some point, he's going to be let sufficiently off the leash for things to go wrong badly. And Corbyn doesn't tend to make that big a mistake in election campaigns. So overall, he's got everything to win, and the Tories have got everything to lose. The momentum will be towards a much closer result than we've had predicted so far. Peter Oborn, now perhaps the most surprising of all, let's think that Dominic Cummings uh, or oh, Boris Johnson says, send for Auburn. That's the man we need for the next few weeks. What would your advice be in the Tory war room? Uh, well, it would be a very simple piece of advice, which is it's time to stop lying. It's terribly damaging, not just to, to him, but to politics and to British but, public but, life. Well, let's be fair. I mean, isn't there a certain lovable vagueness about the Prime Minister on occasion? And you say lovable vagueness. To deliberately to create a video which, is meant, which presents... Keir Starmer, the Brexit spokesman for Labour, as somebody who's completely at a loss for words, and they do that by manipulating the facts, it, manipulating, creating fake, a fake video. That's terrible. Well, so why do you say the go. Tory party are so different from Labour or the Liberal Democrats or the SNP or any other party? Well, I've been studying the other parties. There's always been a level of political deceit in all elections. Richard Murphy, well, oh. let's just assume that the election's not over, as you Maybe, rightly yeah. said, but, uh, but let's just say that uh, Labour failed to close the gap uh, and uh, Corbynism loses another election. Is, will that mean a, a swing away from the left in the Labour Party or will somebody else from that, uh, that wing of the party merely replace Jeremy Corbyn? What's the, what's the future of Labour under these circumstances? I can't see Labour moving back to its old Blair style. That's over. That supposed centre ground, which frankly, from Labour's point of view, was never centre, you know, was right, is not going to return in Labour history. So there is going to be another left of centre person. And the reason why is the young members will not let it go back for rightwards. And they want some of the very clear policies that Jeremy Corbyn does associate with, things like the Green New Deal, the Green Industrial Revolution, as it's called by Labour, but I would call the Green New Deal for my own personal reasons. That is key to it. And I believe they're going to stick with that line, and they're going to stick with the line that we can afford it, because bluntly, we can. And therefore, a, an anti-austerity political economist like yourself must be looking with wonder at this election campaign, where instead of the, the parties competing on austerity, they're now competing on who can spend the most. Well, I'm delighted they are. I mean, as a chartered accountant and as an economist, you would have expected me to be saying, be cautious. Actually, I've just read an article in the Financial Times. It's commonplace talk. The world wants more government bonds. The only way in which the world can buy enough government bonds to meet the demand for them is to, for governments to borrow, to therefore spend, to therefore create the infrastructure that we need in this country and elsewhere around the world. The UK government could borrow £100 billion a year easily to fund the Green New Deal and therefore create... British broadband. 
Well, not the bridge broadband's a tiny part of this cost, but they could literally fulfil their promise. The Liberal OPEC, would the Liberal Democrats, you know, coming back from their post-coalition government lows of the last two elections, would they be satisfied with incremental progress, a few seats here, a few seats there, or, or, or will they think that that's not good enough and they need a, a new approach? They won't be satisfied with incremental growth, but they should be. I think the party has been entirely unrealistic about thinking there'll be some massive uh, sweep to power, as I genuinely think that Jo Swenson and some of her colleagues believe is possible. So it's going to be incremental growth. What they've done right is being really clear about uh, standing as the Remain party, but the leadership isn't plausible, and that's the problem. Joe Swinson's a perfectly nice person, but she's just not cutting it in the Premier League. So let me be, get this correct. As a born-again Brexiteer like yourself, <laughs> you're saying the Liberal Democrats have been absolutely right to be clearly pro-Remain. Yes, because you asked me what they should do, not what the country should do. And for those people who are listening and watching and want to express a Remain perspective, it's the only place to go. Labour's uh, completely confused on it, and we know where the Brexit Party and the Conservatives are. So if you want a Remain party, then it's the Lib Dems, but the momentum just isn't there for that. They're not going to win more than an incremental growth. That They could then get a lot of those disaffected One Nation Conservatives joining the Lib Dems after the election, and then we could be back in your studio talking about the next election. Well, I'm having lots of fun in this discussion because I've, I've heard the advice for respective parties and I'm trying to work out what would happen in an election if all the parties followed your advice. But now we come to the, we come to the meat. We, we come to what's actually going to happen. Richard Murphy, you got halfway through the campaign. What's going to happen in the second half? Labour is going to have a considerably better second half than first half. Will that mean it wins outright? No, I can't see that. Does it mean it will have significantly more seats than polls currently forecast? Yes. Will the Lib Dems pick up 30 seats? Yes. Will the SNP pick up more seats than they've got now in Scotland? Yes. Does that imply, therefore, the Tories aren't going to have as good a time as they currently think they're going to? I think that's highly likely, too. Will they be the largest party? Yes. Will they form the government? I'm still not convinced that the Conservatives will make it into government again. I think there is a chance that there will be a government put together but under a Jeremy Corbyn leadership with support from SNP and Liberal Democrats with a short-term life expectancy which will go through the process of transforming the electoral system, considering the issues around Scottish independence referendum, thinking about issues that the Lib Dems are most concerned about, like a second referendum perhaps, as a way of solving the Brexit problem, and then going back to the country once more, and in two years' time, at the most, we'll be back here again. Now, listening to Richard, Peter, that, that's virtually what you said at the start of the campaign, but if I detect the signs right, you're a bit more pessimistic in the sense that your brand of conservatism has been pushed out and the Boris Johnson brand is, is reigning supreme. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, at the start of the campaign, we had a discussion here and Lembic Opic predicted that Boris Johnson would win quite easily. Uh, and I said, no, I think it's quite likely to be a hung parliament. And I have to say that so far he's been proved uh, more, um, <laughs> a, a more gifted uh, forecasters than me. I mean, the, the two things which have happened to um, change my mind uh, is one, the failure of anything like a Remain alliance. The, re the, le the left is fighting each other. And secondly, the, the, the subsidence of the Brexit party. And so I'd now say that the, the chances are that you'll have a fairly easy uh, Boris Johnson majority, and then we'll leave the European Union a few weeks after that. But could you be wrong again? Could there be a, a, a difference? <laughs> could it be a game of two halves? You ask me, of course I could be wrong again. Are you hoping to be wrong again? I think what would be best for this country is a hung parliament. Yes. Well, but OPEC, now, you've got the, uh, the accolade of, uh, of, of, of looking thus far like you're the, the mystic Meg of this panel. Uh, what do you think? Is it going to continue as we think, or is there a Christmas cracker of a surprise lying awake? Hell falling with that one. I predicted my own victory in 2010, and I was wrong. So <laughs> with that caveat, I stick by my original... Uh, guesstimate that the Conservatives will get an overall majority with Boris Johnson. I'll even put a figure on that. I'm guessing a majority of 40. And that's at the cost of Labour primarily. I think the SNP will make gains in Scotland. Mm -hmm. and I think the Lib Dems will make gains in England. But one to watch is Jo Swinson's own seat. She needs to remember what happened to Nick Clegg in Sheffield Hallam when he was leader and he lost. And if it, 
Is it as simple as to say, look, if the Tories get 320 seats or above, then Brexit happens uh, and uh, you're under a comfortable majority. 315, we're going to be back here in the new year for another election. And 310 or below, you're talking about a rainbow coalition or perhaps a tartan tins rainbow coalition. Is it as simple as that in terms no. of numbers of seats? No, Boris Johnson needs to have a majority, an overall majority, to push Brexit through. Otherwise, we're going to be paralysed just as we have been and we'll be back here in a, in a few months. The Lib Dems have made another mistake. They've said they will not go into coalition with anybody else, clearly stung from the last time, which means they've written themselves out of the script there. No one can depend on their support. So it's really down to whether Boris Johnson has enough of his own allies in his own party to push Brexit through. And for that, he definitely needs a big majority. Well, gentlemen, I, I don't know if the, the electorate are desperate for another election, but I'm sure they're desperate for another <laughs> discussion of this prestigious panel of political pundits. Thank you very much indeed. This was to be the election which finally decided Britain's European future. If the Tories win, we'll be out, and if they don't, we'll be in. Thus far, it all looks like plain sailing for Boris Johnson. Even much of Yorkshire underwater and the most calamitous health statistics in history do not seem to have dented his progress to a working majority. Nigel Farage seems to have conveniently self-combusted, while the other leaders are struggling to lay a glove on him. Indeed, the Liberals and the SNP will claim they were denied that opportunity by being excluded from initial TV debates. Not so much Hamlet without the Prince, but Sinbad without the Sailors. So will the Boris Panto play through the Christmas season to full houses? Not necessarily. There is many a slip between cup and lip, and any of this cast has the ability to fall headlong into the orchestra pit. Despite current appearances, this Christmas Panto's climax might still be decided on very narrow margins. If Boris Johnson makes it to 320 seats or above, then it's a full house and Brexit delivered. If he's stuck on Theresa May's 315 from the last election, then the Parliament is back in its well-hung state. And we may even be heading for a New Year encore in the shape of yet another election. 310 or below for Boris, then look forward to a Corbyn minority government. Not so much a rainbow coalition as perhaps a tartan one. In other words, it ain't over yet. And as in all good pantos, the main protagonist would be well advised to be heed to that well-worn warning, look behind you. Next week, Alex returns to Catalonia to interview the Minister of Digital Policies and Public Administration, who says the Spanish government are moving towards a clampdown on the social media of the rebellious province. Is the next challenge for the Catalonian independence movement going to be maintaining their presence online as well as on the streets? But until then, from Alex and me and all at the show, it's goodbye for now, and we hope to see you then.